Welcome to Quantum Mechanics, a powerful framework for understanding the universe. Hi everybody, welcome back. Today we're really going to get into developing the eigenvalue and eigenvector structure for quantum angular momentum. Last time we developed the ladder operators, or raising and lowering operators, and their commutation relations. This time we're going to focus on this particular corollary. Two very related expressions, or similarly looking, similar looking expressions. And in a certain sense, these are going to be the these two expressions are going to be the heart of our understanding of um, the eigenvalue eigenstructure. So, remember, so what are they? First of all, uh, ket a m is a simultaneous eigenvector of j squared and j three, and we have the bra on the left. So between the two, we have the latter operators, j plus, remember, is j1 plus ij2, and j minus, j1 minus ij2. Okay, so the result is these are equal to numbers, real numbers, and we see that on the right-hand side, and we see that they're functions of a, the eigenvalue of j squared, and m, the eigenvalue of j3. Okay, now they're both greater than or equal to zero. All right, so let me point out one thing. If that's going to be the case, then A must be larger than whichever is bigger, M times M plus 1 or M times M minus 1. That'll come back to uh, have some consequences a little bit later. So we're going to prove the first one. And the second one, if you, if you understand all the details of the first one, it's it's pretty easy. It's the same thing, essentially. Okay, it's a calculation. Write it out. Okay. Well, how does J minus act on, and say acting on the bra from the left, or J plus acting on the ket to the right, how does it work? Well, we only know how J squared acts on these eigenvectors and J3 acts on them. But remember, the last relation we had last time, we had an expression for J minus and J plus in terms of J squared and J, J, J squared and J3. Okay, so we plug this in here. We can use linearity to split it up into three pieces. And look, J squared acting on ket a m is h bar squared a and that's a real number we can pull it all out okay j3 squared acting on that's h bar squared m squared it's a real number we pull it out and minus h bar j3 acting on a m gives us another h bar m pull it out lump them all together use the fact that uh, that bra a m ket a m is 1, normalized, and we have this expression. Now, how do we know it's greater than or equal to 0? That's a good calculation to know how to do. Note that the adjoint of j plus acting on a m, what do we do? This is back from uh, chapter 1. We turn kets into bras, and we take the adjoint, what's multiplying them, and j plus adjoint is nothing more than j minus. So, this is important, and we've seen expressions like this before. This expression is the square of the norm of j plus acting on ket am. Now, if that seems unfamiliar, it shouldn't be, and it's very good revision now, because we saw that type of expression many times in Chapter 1 after we had developed uh, Dirac notation. So this gives us the fact that this expression f 
for 27 is greater than or equal to 0. And it's the same calculation for the next one, 428, because we had a similar expression. There was just a minus sign difference in its strategic location. And there is a minus sign difference in a strategic location here. And you can, you can work that out easily. So please do it. Good practice. OK. Now, remember I said that a for the both of these expressions to be greater than or equal to 0, a had to be larger than or equal to the maximum of m times m plus 1 or m times n minus 1. Now, I want to show this in a figure, which in this figure is essentially the key the key thing to everything we do. I said that a few times, but it's there's a lot of keys, but actually there's only a few. Commutation relations, the corollary we just looked at, and understanding how those fit into the figure. Okay. Here's the graph of... So, graph is horizontal axis is m, and the vertical axis is f of a, which is m times m minus m plus 1 and m times m minus 1. Okay, we put these graphs here. And this is a graph, one graph. This is a graph of m times m minus 1. And for a to be have to be larger than the 2, we disregard the piece below each of the two maximum pieces on either side. So the maximum looks like this. And it's symmetric about the vertical axis. And we see if we fix a value of a, there is a minimum value of m, at which this is 0, and a maximum value of m, which is 0. We call it the minimum value minus j, and the maximum value plus j. This graph is important to understand how it relates to the corollary we just derived. So, m lies between minus j and plus j. Why am I using j? That'll be clear in a few minutes. Now, j is a function of a, and if you go back and look at the figure and the expressions, it's not hard from the coral expressions from the corollary. It's not hard to see that a is j times j plus one. So rather than use a to denote our eigenvalue for j squared, we're going to use j times j plus 1. That makes a more direct uh, connection to j squared. So if we adopt this notation, we're finally done with fiddling with notation. j squared, acting on ket jm, is equal to j times j plus 1 h bar squared ket jm. j3, acting on ket jm, is mh bar Ket JM. Okay, this is our new notation. And if we substitute A equals J plus 1 for 31 into that expression on the right hand side of the corollary for A, we get these expressions. And these are rather nice expressions. They have a 433 and 434. They have a rather a symmetry between where mi the minuses and pluses go on each one. And we're going to exploit that in some detail. OK, so this material seemed a little bit technical. And you know, that's kind of the nature of the rest of what we're going to be doing. It all comes 
from commutation relates from the definition of, of the latter operators, raising and lowering operators, j plus and j minus, the commutation relations, this corollary, and we have this nice little figure on the next page which illustrates what this means for it to be greater than or equal to zero. We did get the fact that a is j times j plus one from inspecting the figure and relating it to the maximum and minimum values and we substitute that value of a in here and we get these kind of final expressions that we're going to play with quite a lot. So where did the raising and lowering operators get off to? Well they're in here. You can see j plus acting on jm to the right and j minus acting on rym to the left. So we have some interesting things to do now with these and we're going to get a very interesting result once we're finished. Okay it's a very technical part. There's a few lectures that are going to be quite technical. I urge you to work out, not a lot of details, just a few pages, work out the details so that you understand where things, the, the structure behind all of this. Commutation relations, raising and lowering operators, and this corollary. It all comes from that. Okay, until next time, see you. Bye.